Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Sorrell, and I'm the Executive Director of the UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge. Thank you all so much for joining us today. If you'd like to ask a question during today's session, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our moderator today is Dr. Jamie Landman. Dr. Landman has served as the chair of the Department of Urology since January 2011. He was previously the director of minimally invasive urology in the Department of Urology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York. Dr. Landman is also the co-director of the UCI Surgical Education Center and is the founder and director of the UCI Ablative Oncology Center. Dr. Landman is respected as an international expert in the management of kidney cancer and is a pioneer and recognized expert on the application of minimally invasive techniques for ablation of kidney cancer. He has performed over 4,000 advanced minimally invasive procedures. Dr. Landman's research efforts have resulted in the publication of over 400 peer-reviewed manuscripts, chapters, and books and his research has helped to define the minimally invasive standard of treatment for kidney cancer. Dr. Lamman has also helped educate physicians around the world. He is course director for multiple international courses annually and organizes major meetings around the world. This year, he will be the scientific director of the World Congress of Endourology here on the West Coast and will be co-director of the first Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons meeting to take place in the US. Dr. Lamman has trained over 25 fellows, many of whom are now leaders in minimally invasive urology around the world. And he has created unique educational programs such as the summer surgery program, which inspires younger students. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Lamman. Jennifer, thank you so much for that accessibly kind introduction. Uh, welcome everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the prostate cancer and a higher standard of care, uh, and it's a, a great privilege to do that. Uh, we have uh, two amazing speakers that I'll introduce in just a little bit. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the standard of care is, it's actually a legal term for the true excellence that every physician is supposed to, to engender in their practice every day. And uh, as an academic medical center, it's our job to actually change and improve that standard of care and make sure that the standard of care tomorrow is higher than the standard of care today. So I get the great joy of sharing with you some of the things we're doing in urology to do that, in including a little bit about prostate cancer before going through um, our prostate cancer presentations. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2010, I joined this great faculty uh, and David Lee, you can see one of our speakers was there as a fellow, but this is the entire faculty. There were eight faculty. This is the fellows, the residents and everybody. Next slide, please. And we are all truly dedicated to discover, teach and heal. That means research, education and great world-class clinical care. And if you're laser focused on that, next slide, please. This is what happens. That faculty turns into 26 world-class experts. Next slide, please. And if you, you'll notice, we have every aspect of urology covered. People fly to Orange County now from all over the country and all over the world to get the best care in urology. So if you're in Orange County, you do not have to leave because other people are coming here from all over. Uh, next slide, please. We, we also have the best pediatric urology team, making sure the kids of Orange County are well, well, take, well taken care of. And Tony Corey has built an awesome team. And perhaps the most important team is, uh, next slide, is this group here. And we'll jump straight to the next slide. These are four basic scientists actually in the Department of Urology, making sure that not only do you get the best cancer care tomorrow anywhere right here, but Josh Morney there is a bioengineer and Carol Dow Davis is a PhD who assures that the children of Orange County that their treatment strategies are optimized in every way. So really great group of people. Next slide, please. And, and what we find now is that you're all, this great urology team working at UCI is doing great things because UCI is wonderful, fertile ground. None of us are as smart as all of us, as you can see there. And our urology teams work with all sorts of different people from industry, uh, engineering, Beckman laser, pathology, nephrology, even the School of Art now to make sure we're making progress in every realm. Next slide, please. 
With regards to education, we are uh, absolutely killing it. So we run the Surgical Education Center through urology. You can see Dr. Allering and Dr. Clayman teaching some robotics. They're, they're hugging the robot up, to, up there on the left and down below they're teaching people. But we teach medical students, fellows, residents, doctors from uh, around here, around the country and around the world. Next slide, please. In fact, you can get a feel for how many people we are and that's the building over there. And I snapped that picture with the rainbow because it, it kind of represents the, the joy that comes out of that building. Next, next slide, please. With regards to education, this is a typical grand rounds. At UCI Urology, of course, we, we always wanna take it to the next level, getting a better and greater standard of care. Next slide, please. So we actually have an international uh, grand rounds. We do it digitally. We've done this long before COVID. This was just last week. People from all over the country, all over the world, we now engage 5,000 people with our departmental grand rounds every year. Next slide, please. We have the best residents around, very proud of this group. And this is the heart of our educational program. These are the future great urologists. Next slide, please. This is them in their more native uh, uh, environment. They seem to be eating a lot. Next slide. And, and we also re outreach to the community. So UCI Urology for decades has been doing outreach programs. This high school outreach has been going for well over 12 years now, <clears throat> and it has engaged every high school in Orange County. We do focus on getting back the ones in less privileged areas so we can make sure that these people are stimulated to consider STEM careers at, at science, technology, education, and math. Next slide, please. Excuse me, engineering and math. We also have the summer surgery program, which is for very high performing students. We bring high school students in. To, they actually watch cases in the operating room. And within two weeks, they're mandated to innovate. And one of them, one of their groups wins that prize there. That's the golden light bulb. These students are amazing and the innovations they come up with are, are unbelievable. Next slide, please. And with regards to the this is just to show you how many people we're engaging every year. And the last number there is in 20, a 20 and we were engaging 28,000 people. This year, I'm really hoping we're gonna hit 33,000 people. So we continue to grow and serve our community in a very robust way. Uh, and it's not just about the number of people we're treating, it's about the excellence in the care we're delivering. Next slide, please. So we're building new facilities. Next slide, please. We're trying to create facilities with the best people in it. So we have beautiful staff that treats people with dignity and respect, the best doctors. Next slide, please. This is an example here, Dr. Uccio, we were the first and continue to be the only people in Orange County uh, who have the Artemis system. This is a uh, MRI ultrasound fusion. We do with our radiologist and Dr. Uccio and some of our other faculty, an amazing job of biopsying prostates so that we get people who need surgery or treatment get it and those who don't go home and, and stay home where they belong without any unnecessary treatment. Next, please. And of course, Dr. Lee will be talking later. He's joined our team here. Next slide, please. So the Comprehensive Prostate Cancer Center uh, folds into one of our biggest initiatives going on right now. And this isn't just the Department of Urology, it's multidisciplinary. You got Tom Allering right there, Ed Uccio, Greg Jin, and of course, next slide, please. You got David Lee joining that team. So we have the best prostate cancer surgeons in the world. And right under that are three amazing individuals. So that's Ed Nelson, the head of oncology and the oncology team with our uh, level one cancer center combined with Vahid Yagmai and the best radiologist in the world, Alan Chen over there on the lower right, radiation oncology. That means we offer a multidisciplinary approach. It's gonna be the best bar none. Next slide, please. We also have a minimally invasive philosophy that's, that's really, um, very important and we're evolving beyond where other people are. They think that the robot is minimally invasive and it is, and we'll talk about that a bit, but we're going further. So next slide, please. You can see there in 2022, there'll be 17.5 million cancers in the US. And if you track that bar back down to 1975, there were 3.6 million. And some of that is certainly more screening, more imaging, but this is our environment and we know this and it's estimated by some of the most advanced mathematical formulas possible that about 70% of cancers are utterly avoidable. Next slide, please. So what we're doing is having a new idea, a new approach, next slide. And we're gonna build a men's health hub to be in parity with the women's health centers that exist. Next slide, please. We're gonna build this hub. We're gonna to talk to you about some people, our prostate cancer program and prevention to help men avoid cancers. Next slide. So the hub is just gonna be a great place, next slide just going to be a beautiful environment. I'll show you a little bit more about this late, later. Men don't like going to the doctor. Women tend to, to rule the roost when it comes to healthcare. 
but it's because we just don't enjoy the process as men. And we're gonna change that a little bit. Next slide. We also wanna provide an amazing hospitality experience. And this is something that Ron Solomon, one of the kindest urologists that ever lived engendered. And it's gonna be a, a, a new way of delivering care. Next slide. So what we want, next slide please, is to have kindness be, not just excellence, but kindness be a great focus. What we want is lady and gentlemen scholars running the place with great caring, compassion, and diligence. Next slide, please. And what we want is to get a personalized care team. And this is what we're building right now. Dedicated host for this facility, nurse navigators, increased staffing, people that will help people negotiate their options. There are so many great options. And we want people to really understand every resource that's out there for them. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So prostate cancer. We're all here to talk about prostate cancer, and, and that's where we're headed. Next slide. So I already told you about this world-class team. And again, I want to emphasize that at, next slide with David Lee, uh, who's come on board to lead the Prostate Cancer Center, what we're going to be doing is multidisciplinary. This is not a bunch of urologists doing more cases. This is a bunch of great world-class urologists redefining how the surgery should be done, but working with everyone else at UCI and a level one NIH cancer center to make sure men get great prostate cancer care. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And, and finally, we're gonna be the first people in Orange County to really focus on prevention. So we have a men's health director, that's Faisal Yafi, a focus on diet, sleep, and wellness through the Sam Welly Institute. And we're building this little center right here on Bird Street in, in Newport Beach for men to be able to have these kind of resources at their fingertips. Next slide, please. I just want to show you a quick animation if you can launch that. That's a cool motorcycle, beautiful plants, all sorts of fun tricked out place. So men will actually want to come here. And you'll notice that despite, despite the fact that this is a urology office, yes, we actually built a kitchen in here. Why? We think that if people all people, not just men, come in here and learn from doctors, nurses, scientists, farmers, all working together, and chefs, of course, we're going to be able to teach people how to make good, healthy meals that are inexpensive, taste great, and are super uh, valuable for their, from, from a nutritional perspective. So this kitchen is not only a place where we can teach some 18 people at a time, but more importantly, it has a built-in movie studio, so we'll be able to create digital content. The rest of this is just a super cool lounge where men can come to get their care, feel super comfortable, treated with dignity and respect, get educational resources that they may not get anywhere else on the planet. Next slide, please. So I told you a little bit about our innovative approaches and uh, the Prostate Cancer Center, um, which we are, uh, which is really our flagship initiative at the current time, is, is amazing. And to talk a little about prostate cancer, we have two amazing guests. And first, I'm going to talk about uh, Dr. Thomas Allering, who I was going to start by telling you was one of the uh, highly, most highly regarded urologic oncologists on the planet. But I'll, I'll just give you more examples. If you're a president or dignitary and you're in the know around the world, this is the guy who takes care of your prostate. Even more impressive, if you're a world-class leader, prostate cancer surgeon, and you get prostate cancer, those are the guys who come to TA, Tom Allering our guy right here. So he is respected uh, around the world. He received his medical degree at St. Louis University. Uh, he did his residency at USC and then a two-year fellowship with the very uh, famous Don Skinner. Following his training, he immediately became the division chief of urologic oncology at the City of Hope. And then that was from 86 to 92. And then we were lucky and smart and we recruited him here to UCI. And even as a young man, he became the chief of the division and, and, and ran that from 1992 until 2002. <clears throat> His years of experience in treatment of prostate cancer, bladder cancer, kidney, and testicular cancer placed him as one of the original America's best doctors, and he's been there since 1994. He received local, national, and international recognition for his expertise in urologic oncology, particularly with his early development of his technique for robotic radical prostatectomy with the da Vinci robot. In fact, he was the first one to do so here in Southern California. He's done over 2,500 of these, uh, including be doing the first person, not only here, but in Denmark, Australia, Canada, and other places. But since 2002, uh, his research efforts have concentrated on maximizing functional recovery. So this is the guy who makes sure you get a negative margin that your cancer is cured but he is about making sure that you are 100% what you were 
after as you were before. And his work is really focused on doing that for every man. Uh, his work has been highly regarded in the scientific community. He has over 400 published abstracts and journal articles. He's consistently been in the one or 2% in academic experts in prostatectomy research. Most recently, and this is amazing, he was recognized as the top 2% of all medical scientists in the world in a research science uh, Stanford study. Uh, he's a highly awarded and acknowledged among his peers. He was won a Lifetime Achievement Award from NARIS, the Robotic Society. He also was recognized here. <clears throat> he got the Lauds and Laurels Award for Outstanding Faculty Achievement in Mentorship. And that's not just in the medical school, that's for the entire UCI system. Overall, I'm very proud to introduce to you my, my partner, my very good friend and a world-class colleague, Dr. Allerin. Thank you, Dr. Lamman. Thanks. So I have been given the, the wonderful task of being able to talk to you about uh, testosterone and prostate cancer and high-risk disease and prevention of recurrence. Next. So the history of prostate cancer and testosterone is a varied and uh, complicated one. In, in 1941, <clears throat> Dr. Huggins and uh, Dr. Hodges did some bench work and they figured out that and we're not, it's not really clear to me how we thought of this, but they thought that maybe if we reduce the testosterone uh, in these men who would present with metastatic prostate cancer to the bone, that they would get improvement. And they su subjected these men at that point to the only way we could get the testosterone down was castration. Next. And because of this work, uh, in 1966, they won the Nobel Prize in medicine, next. But it was at this point that you would have to say when you look back that there was the, the truth and the myth. So the, the truth was is that in widely metastatic prostate cancer, testosterone was to maybe use a euphemism, the, the enemy, you wanted to get rid of testosterone. <clears throat> and the thought process beyond that point was that Testosterone must be bad the whole time. Next. So historically, there was always this feeling that uh, a low testosterone was better, high testosterone could lead to prostate cancer, and there was a, sort of an undue fear of exacerbating the disease because of that. However, um, we've also known that the testosterone is very important for muscle support. And there are a lot of problems when men do become very low testosterone or hypogonadal. So what happened to me actually that brought my attention to testosterone is in the 2005 to 2008 year, <clears throat> I was looking at men that were recovering from surgery the way we wanted uh, from a sexual point of view, sexual function point of view. And there was like a missing link. And I spoke with the editor of the journal of sexual medicine. And I said, do you think testosterone be could having some role in this? And he said, you know, you should be checking testosterone on every patient that you see. And I took him at his word. And uh, he also made a very important part that the total testosterone, in other words, just the regular testosterone was not what you needed to know. You had to know the free testosterone, which is the part of the testosterone that's not bound to protein and can get into the muscle and the blood and to other important structures like nerves and the brain. So we started to look at this and collect data on every patient. Next. So from June, uh, excuse me, from December of 2009 through June of 2018, we had 850 patients that we had data on and, and who had undergone a radical prostatectomy. On each man, we collected their total testosterone and then a sex hormone binding globulin. And with those two, you can calculate uh, what the free testosterone is. And then what happened is we had uh, 152 men that we, that we felt were low, nearly 20% of our, our population remarkably, and they were placed on testosterone replacement if you know, they had low risk disease, uh, pathologically confirmed to the prostate, you know, an undetectable PSA and a low baseline uh, three month levels. If they were below 0.57, then we would put them on it. That's the, uh, the bottom 25% <clears throat> quartile. And we were really mainly looking to see if that would help in the recovery of erection function, which is where I had initially noticed, you know, I don't understand why some of these guys are not recovering. Maybe it's low testosterone. Next. 
So the sum of our studies has shown a lot of very interesting things. We, we almost always hear that as men get older, the testosterone goes down and, and the red bush here with, <clears throat> with the black line going straight across indicates that actually the total testosterone as men go, you can see it's from age 40 to age 80 at the bottom down here, uh, that it's really pretty flat. There's, there isn't that uh, finding that as men get older, the testosterone goes down. However, if you go down to this, the, the blue <clears throat> check box down here, you can see that the line is actually going up and that's the sex hormone binding globulin. And what happens is now, if you just go to the green box over here, you can see that the free testosterone, which is the active component, goes down as men age. So that's where the truth that it is. And if, we, if you really wanna know how patients are doing, you have to get the free testosterone. And the best way to do the free testosterone actually is to calculate it. It's such a small um, molecule that to do it directly, it's not as accurate as if you take these larger molecules and actually calculate it. So um, we've been collecting this data and this is what we led to the next findings, next slide. So interestingly, uh, just on sexual function, we found out that as men age from 40 to 60, as their uh, <clears throat> free testosterone goes down, as you can see the, the free testosterone is going down here, <clears throat> the, the impact on the, this IIEF5, which is a, it's a sexual function metric, and it, it was marginal, almost no, no change at all. So men, their, their free testosterone would go down, but we didn't see any real issues with uh, sexual function in the uh, <clears throat> native loss of sexual function. But then remarkably, if you just continue to follow them from 60 to 80, you can see that uh, it, it becomes much more functional. And we're not exactly sure why that is, but as men go <clears throat> from 60 to 80, there is a significant drop in sexual function as, as the free testosterone goes down. So it, it seems like probably it's, it's a really long period of time and sexual function doesn't get impacted much in the 60s, but somewhere around the late 50s and early 60s, there's a big change and it really starts to make a big difference. So it, it really says that you have to measure the free testosterone in these gentlemen. You can't really ask them for symptoms. You have to measure it. And, and technically that has just never really been done. Next. So then what else did we find? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, as you can see, that as the free testosterone in this arrow goes down, the aggressiveness of the cancer, which is the grade, the aggressiveness goes up dramatically. So the lower the free testosterone, the higher <clears throat> risk disease that they would have. And this slide also just did a similar sort of thing. This was a stage and you could also see that as the free testosterone went down, the uh, stage went up. Next. Lastly, uh, on, in, the, in this form of, the, <clears throat> of our analysis, we also just looked at you know, what kind of a difference it would make in the, rec in the recurrence of prostate cancer is based on the PSA. So after we do the surgery, the way we know how the recurrence is happening or not is if they have a, what we call a non-detectable uh, PSA, which is less than zero, basically, less than 0 0.05, or it's a very low PSA. And you can see that um, for men with higher um, free testosterones, <clears throat> they had a lower recurrence. And the red line is the guys who, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, the, the blue line is, is the guys who had the lower testosterone and they had a higher recurrence rate as compared to the red line. So it, it also uh, impacted the men after surgery. If they had low testosterone, it, it appeared to increase the risk of having the cancer come back, which would make sense because it was making the cancers more aggressive. And so that, that's what you would expect next. So we started replacing uh, <clears throat> testosterone. And these are, uh, this is taken from some publications we've had in the British Journal. And, but one of the main things that there was a major concern about and we're, which has been a long-term, if you listen or talk to most doctors, they would say, well, you know, prostate cancer is turned on by <clears throat> testosterone. And it looks like actually it's just the opposite that is the case. So um, 
in this uh, <clears throat> graph here on the left-hand side, you can see that it, in the men that we supplemented them uh, with their testosterone replacement, we, we reduced the recurrence rate by 53%. Next. And the other thing that we learned is if they were destined to recur, there, you know, the red is, <clears throat> is the men that were on replacement. It delayed the recurrence. So it prevented and delayed um, the recurrence in prostate cancer. Again, all in line, and, and it, it's uh, a very significant sign that men with high testosterone uh, tend to be a bit better fit. Next. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, we, we've already discussed and we know for sure that once the cancer becomes metastatic, sort of late in the disease process, um, we got to get rid of the testosterone. But in the, in the early period leading up to it, there's evidence to suggest that it, it is just the opposite. Next. So in this slide, you can see that there have been a lot of publications and I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the most important uh, studies here in the bottom is that they took a very large <clears throat> population of 500,000 men uh, and they were able to find out if, if they were in the highest category of getting the injections, uh, shot injections, versus the lowest uh, <clears throat> category of, of just one to two, and the other one they had greater than 12. They showed that the guys who had less um, testosterone replacement uh, had a 33% uh, <clears throat> association with increased risk of developing prostate cancer. So it appears too that men with low testosterone will increase the risk of getting prostate cancer, and they will increase the risk of having more aggressive prostate cancer. Next. So if you want to kind of think of it as sort of a scheme, you can see uh, as these wheels uh, are trying to demonstrate as uh, <clears throat> testosterone deficiency happens, you know, you start to get into this level of hypogonadism and the consequence of that is it causes metabolic syndrome. Uh, there's increased um, loss of muscle mass. So there's increased weight in the midsection of the abdomen, increased blood sugars all leading to the development and making the cancer worse. But once it gets to a point where the cancers become metastatic, it's not as concerned about the metastatic, um, excuse me, the metabolic component of the syndrome. It, it flips over to genetic. So it looks like in, in the, the vast majority of the time in prostate cancer, low testosterone, you want to you wanna correct. But if it does, if it is, late and delayed, then you, you do have to go to castration or castrating, temporarily castrating medications. So it's, it's a, really a tale of two cities. Next. So <clears throat> the, the, what we've really learned that low testosterone is not uh, determined accurately by the total. So you can't just have a total testosterone. You have to get the free testosterone. And you do that through the sex hormone binding globulin. We learned that <clears throat> low uh, free testosterone doesn't tend to impact the men much um, below the age of 60, but once you get above 60, it does. And it also reduces the ability for the recovery of sexual function next. And <clears throat> our conclusions are that the low free T should be checked in all patients, especially men undergoing a radical prostatectomy. And you can see that the testosterone replacement is not something that makes things worse, it makes it better. Um, but you do have to be careful because if the patient gets into a higher risk disease category, then you know it may have to be stopped. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, so for those of you who don't recognize that, uh, Dr. Allering, what he just said is so counter to everything that we were taught as urologists, that if you give somebody with testo uh, testosterone with prostate cancer, you're going to kill them. Uh, Dr. Allen, can you mute your, your mic, please? The, the bottom line is his innovative research is helping a lot of people, and that's fantastic. We'll have a chance to ask some questions afterwards. Next, I get the great privilege of introducing uh, a very close friend, a faculty member, uh, Dr. David Lee. Uh, we were just blessed as can be to be able to recruit uh, Dr. Lee one year ago or so here to the Department of Urology at UCI. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and you'll understand why in a second. So he, he's now a uh, professor of urology here at UCI Health. He directs our comprehensive prostate cancer center, which was why we recruited him. He clearly specializes in robotic prostate cancer. In fact, he has one of the leading expertises in the world 
He's completed more than 6,600 cases. And it's amazing. Uh, this is a fellow who I would, had the privilege of training with him. And when, when he came into St. Louis, and this was over 20 years ago, I, I, it was my job to show him how to do a laparoscopic uh, surgery. And we were training. I had been training for three years and worked, up, worked out real hard to get pretty decent at it. I showed him how to do it. And within five minutes, he was better than I was. This guy is just magical in surgery in every way. He recently served as the chief of urology at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center as associate professor of surgery and urology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's published over 200 articles and abstracts and book uh, chapters in the field of minimally invasive urologic surgery. He really focuses on improvement of technique for robotic prostatectomy to get the very best outcomes. Uh, he directed the Penn Robotic Urology Surgery Fellowship and just launched one here at UCI. Uh, he was surgeon champion for NISQIP, which is a, our national quality and safety uh, program, which is a huge deal. He served there as commissioner on cancer, cancer liaison for physicians uh, for Penn uh, Presbyterian, and directed quality efforts there. Dr. Lee has also been recognized in Best Doctors in America, Castle Connolly, and all the other accolades. Uh, he came here a year ago and has gotten busy as can be already. Um, so, Dr. Lee, thank you for joining us, and please regale us with tales of your work. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Landman. Um, yeah, it's a um, real privilege and honor to be here, uh, not only speaking today, but in the department, um, as I'm sure you've seen. And um, I'm always so impressed with uh, Dr. Landman and Dr. Allering, the work that they do and the vision that they have. Uh, so it's been really um, unbelievable to be a part of this now here in California. So uh, the title of my talk is Robot Prostatectomy Past, Present and Future. I think it's always important to ground yourself in where we've come from uh, to really appreciate the um, kind of progress that we've made. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a picture of the very first operating room in the United States. Uh, so working at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, this hospital called Pennsylvania Hospital uh, was part of our health system, a major part of um, the Penn Health uh, Network. And this room is preserved um, kind of as a museum, but this is actually the first operating room in the United States. Um, Pennsylvania Hospital was the first uh, hospital, uh, University of Pennsylvania was the first university. This was constructed in 1804. Um, the early fathers of our country decided, yeah, we need to start teaching surgeons in the US rather than in England and then bringing them over. So uh, they built this operating room. As you can see, it doesn't look like operating rooms now. It's kind of like theater stating. It seated 130 students. But then you can see on the slide, there were major advances that happened after the operating room opened. Uh, it wasn't until 1840 that people started using anesthesia of some kind. Uh, the whole idea of germs and infection and sterile technique didn't start becoming a thing until 1900. Uh, and so it's unbelievable to see what, over a short period of time, how much progress that we've made in medicine. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as prostate cancer goes, uh, the very first reported prostatectomy was done by Hugh Hampton Young. He's uh, widely known as one of the fathers of our specialty in neurology. Uh, he performed a perineal prostatectomy. The first uh, prostatectomy done through the abdomen was done by uh, Dr. Millen in 1947. But even up until the 1970s, which wasn't that long ago, radical prostatectomy was rarely performed because there were major side effects associated with it. Next slide, please. So we owe a debt of gratitude to this man, Dr. Patrick Walsh. Dr. Walsh served as chairman of urology at Johns Hopkins for many years, uh, but one of the seminal work, um, you know, uh, compilations that he did was studying the anatomy of the prostate. So because of the work that he did, he made a uh, radical prostatectomy a real uh, operation that patients could go through and surgeons could have success with. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so he helped us to understand the blood flow around the prostate. And so we could avoid major blood loss. He helped us to understand where the erection function nerves were so that we could actually save erection function. And then he helped us to understand what the muscles were like uh, inside, the, uh, inside the pelvis so that we could help spare those structures. Next slide, please. And so this is a picture a diagram of what an, a radical prostatectomy would look like, uh, but a diagram isn't what it really looks like, unfortunately. Once you're looking inside a deep, dark pelvis, it's a big reach in some patients. And so even though Dr. Walsh made these advances, uh, it's technically a very difficult operation to do. But it became the standard of care for men with low-risk prostate cancer uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And then now I feel like it's the standard of care for men with a more than 10-year life expectancy, and especially with, now with high-risk disease. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Clayman, who you've seen before. He was the chairman before Dr. Landman, and he uh, of our department, but uh, we also owe him a debt of gratitude in urology because he performed the very first laparoscopic kidney removal ever in the world. Um, he actually also helped to contribute to the first small series of laparoscopic prostatectomy, but the conclusion of their article is that technically it was just too challenging because of some of the things that I mentioned. Uh, it's a deep, dark hole once you're going into the pelvis, even laparoscopically. And so there was quite a challenge there, especially sewing the bladder back to the urethra. Next slide, please. So the evolution of robot prostatectomy happened. Um, Again, with the foundation of the anatomic work that Dr. Walsh did, uh, Dr. Bertrand Guillano, who's a wonderful, wonderful gifted surgeon, reported on his work where he worked really hard to develop a technique where he could do this laparoscopically, and so reported this in 2000. Uh, then Dr. Menon, uh, who you see pictured here, who was the chairman of urology at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and who was also a resident under Dr. Walsh, thought, oh, I want to learn how to do laparoscopic prostatectomy as well. So then he uh, asked Dr. Guillano to come over to Detroit, spend some time with him, um, but found that he had a really hard time doing it. Um, obviously, it's a technically very difficult operation. So then Dr. Menon, um, who's also incredibly brilliant, uh, had the idea of taking a robot, uh, which was really looking for a home because this surgical robot, which I'll describe here in a second, uh, really was originally designed for cardiac surgery, but uh, they weren't sure where else to use it. So then Dr. Menon put two and two together and then started applying robotics for prostate cancer. Um, next slide, please. And so the benefits of this robot, you can see uh, here on the lower right, we have these four different uh, ports or instruments that can be inserted through the abdomen in a laparoscopic fashion so that we can do a minimally invasive surgery. But uh, the camera gives us 10 times magnified vision as well as three-dimensional vision. The instruments themselves have wrists at the very tip of the instrument. And so, sewing the bladder back to the urethra becomes very easy as compared to even open surgery. And so the benefits of this robot, um, and again, the, I, I, a better term for robotic surgery may be computer assisted surgery because the robot isn't really something that works autonomously in any way. Uh, you as the surgeon who's controlling it need to be controlling it in order for it to actually move. And so it's more like a master slave or computer assisted surgery. But this robot ended up being very applicable for prostate cancer surgery. Next slide, please. And then, so this is what happened to me in Philadelphia when I first arrived. So I, I was, again, as Dr. Uh, Landman mentioned, uh, I was a fellow working with him uh, under his uh, direction at St. Louis, in, at Washington University of St. Louis. But then I was brought out here by Dr. Clayman um, to be the first fellow uh, in urology here at UCI. But then I worked with Tom Allering, um, who, you know, I was the fellow who helped Tom to for, do the first 50 robot prostatectomies in Southern California. And then, so after California, then I went on to Texas for a couple of years where I helped start the very first uh, large uh, robotic practice in the South Central US, but then went to Penn. And so in 2005, uh, this 
these green bars are the numbers for my hospital. And so I wasn't even there in 2004, but in 2005, we started doing robotics here. Um, our flagship hospital at Penn was the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and the dark blue here. And so they had been the major center for many years, but then over a relatively short period of time, I was doing a large amount of surgery uh, because robotics is really attractive to patients. Um, the other hospitals where you see a rise in their numbers as well, which actually surpassed what Hup was doing before, uh, were Bryn Mawr Hospital, where I have a friend who also did robotics, and also Fox Chase, where they also adopted this technology. But you can see overall the numbers of radical process techniques that were being done in Philadelphia are much higher than what they were in 2004. And so, and I think it's because of the benefits of this technology um, and the ability to surgeons to actually do a good job with it. Next slide, please. So then in the current day now, uh, it's more than 90% of cases are done with the robot for radical prostatectomy. Uh, we have at least equivalents in blood law, uh, no, we have much better blood loss numbers, but equivalents at least, but I think better numbers as far as urine control, uh, sexual function, and you know some of Tom's data is really unbelievable as far as how he's been tracking things. Um, we are able to take catheters out in one week as opposed to two to three weeks with the open surgery, and it's because we do a better job sewing the bladder back to the urethra. Uh, next slide, please. And then one thing that I've worked really hard on over the past several years is to develop a pathway uh, to send patients home the same day, because for many years we were keeping patients in the hospital overnight, but nothing would ever happen to them. The guys were you know, staying overnight feeling fine. Uh, so then we offered uh, uh, an outpatient option, uh, but then this was also um, kind of pushed forward by COVID because once COVID started, people didn't want to stay in the hospital anymore. But fortunately, we had already worked out a pathway to send guys home the same day. So in conjunction with our anesthesia team, our um, post anesthesia recovery unit, uh, we made a really uh, comfortable pathway for patients. Uh, this is a picture here of a needle that I actually pass inside the abdomen at the conclusion of the case. And we inject um, a numbing agent into the wall of the abdomen from the inside, because in that way we can very reliably place this um, as a regional block in patients in a very rapid fashion. And this has also helped to decrease our pain scores and get guys home the same day. So 95% of the guys that we do the surgery for, they're, they're home, uh, sleeping in their own bed that night. Next slide, please. Uh, there are other modifications that surgeons are doing all over the country as far as uh, ways to improve surgery. Um, this is one of them where we take a different approach, leaving the bladder uh, pasted up on the anterior abdominal wall while taking out the prostate from behind. Next slide, please. Um, one of my friends, Misa Han at uh, Johns Hopkins, pioneered the use of adding two robots together where you can insert a rectal probe, which is held by a robot, which would then give you a live ultrasound image so that you can use that to navigate during a robot prostatectomy procedure. Next slide, please. Um, I think this work is probably more applicable to the longer term future. Dr. Porpiglia from Italy is uh, working really hard to develop a reliable technique to use MRI images, uh, which were done preoperatively uh, in order to help guide surgery and uh, help us to decrease our margin rates even further. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that I worked on with our engineering team at Penn uh, was a way to add haptic feedback or tactile feedback to the robot. So this is a picture of Dr. Catherine Kuchenberg, uh, and we uh, pioneered the use of this tactile feedback device. Uh, our work got kind of slowed up because she became the director of robotics at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. I hear the robot that we were working on is now getting shipped over there so she can continue this work. Next slide, please. And then uh, I think one of the really cool advances that we're seeing these days is that Intuitive Surgical, the manufacturer of the robot has a single port robot now. So instead of four separate incisions, we can place all four instruments through one larger incision. So my friend Jihad Kauk at the Cleveland Clinic reported on the use of this robot for prostatectomy. Next slide, please. 
He compared 100 cases with the single port with 110 of the multi port, found that he had patients stay in the hospital for a shorter amount of time and use less narcotic uh, without compromising any of the other outcomes. Um, I did two of these yesterday. There's definitely a learning curve, but um, it's really, it's the technology is really amazing. So uh, the future, I think, for minimally invasive surgery is really bright. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions, but again, it's always, uh, when you look back, it's amazing to see how far we've come. So, um, and what we can offer patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, uh, as usual, beautifully done. So I, I will say that these two guys, they are of course working with the best equipment on the planet, but it's about the best people in the, in the world, meaning the best surgeons, but the best nurses, anesthesiologists, uh, of course, the oncologists, radiologists, everyone around them. So that's why these two guys are able to develop, really deliver world-class care. So just uh, just to jump straight to the questions, there's a couple that have already been asked. If you'd like to ask your own question, please uh, just pop them into the uh, Q&A and we will, of course, uh, respond. I saw one earlier, the, the question was, was this uh, being recorded? And the answer is yes. Um, hopefully our team at the end will tell you how you can access this if you'd like to see that again. Uh, the first question is for you, Dr. Allery. Uh, how have your findings been received by your colleagues around the world who for decades have believed the, uh, the opposite? Oh, the question just disappeared, but I think that was the gist of it. Well, that's a very good question. It's, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of reluctance to it. it it's, it's counterintuitive and People are very slow to make the change. I mean, the, I think the people that look at the data said, well, you know, we, we just have to have the courage to move ahead. But uh, that might be the, the factor because it, you, you're, the downside is you could make things a lot worse. Um, and so that's what people worry about. But, you know, for us, we just were very careful monitoring the PSA. And there are now several studies out showing it is safe and that it, that it is better. But it's it, there's still a lot of reluctance, you know, because even a lot of people haven't heard of it. But that's a very good question, you know. How do we get over that hump where, you know, all men have their testosterone levels checked and that they're addressed? But it's it's we're still a ways away from that. I think anytime you bring new knowledge, there's a lot of resistance. Uh, as a department, we a lot of us do this, and we there's a lot of wind in our face. But uh, your data is very strong, and I'm sure you'll help a lot of people over time. I'll answer the next one quickly. What other specialties use robotic surgery? So urology was really the one that introduced it, but uh, uh, general surgery, OBGYN, ENT, um, OBGYN, I, I, which I said, pretty much every surgical specialty, uh, except for orthopedics, I haven't seen them. They have their own robots. Um, the next question is, what other treatment options are there for prostate cancer? And uh, Dr. Lee, you uh, run our center now, so why don't you uh, expound on that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I think uh, this is one of the really important uh, concepts with prostate cancer. Surgery is a great option, but it's not for everybody. So it's um, uh, there's radiation, which takes several different forms, um, but all of those treatment options are very effective. Uh, there's hormonal therapy, which uh, Dr. Allering described at the beginning of his talk. Um, and then Dr. Uccio is specializing in focal therapy. So you can freeze just a small part of the prostate. You can use high intensity focus ultrasound to burn just part of the prostate. And so there are a whole lot of different options that are available. So it's really important to go to some place that has experience with all of these different modalities so that you can get really the best tail treatment for your individual type of cancer. And of course, we have great radiation oncology team. So yeah. Next question is also for you, Dr. Lee. Do we have the single port robot? Looks a little more compact. Uh, do you think it'll replace the Da Vinci at some point? Pros, cons? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I, we do have a single port. Um, so far, the only specialties that are using it are urology, um, and I think it's me, and then um, uh, head and neck surgery. So uh, there are limitations uh, with this robot. Uh, the um, having the robot arms all come from the same point really reduces how much you can pull things apart. And so depending on the patient, you know, there may not 
be this requirement is if a guy has a small prostate and is really thin, then a single port could re work really well. But in larger men, larger prostates, um, you, you really need a little bit more um, force, uh, so to speak, in order to hold things apart. And so there's, there's a place for a single port as far as the armamentarium of what we have available to us to do surgery for patients. Uh, but I don't think it's going to ever replace the multi-port uh, option. Oh, I think I think you're muted, Dr. Landman. Oh, my wife likes it that way. The next <laughs> question is also for you. Is the next, do you think that uh, outpatient radical prostatectomy is common across the country? Uh, no, I, I think Dr. Allering and I are... Um, two of the very few who actually offer outpatient prostatectomy. So I, I don't think there's more than five to 10 centers in the country who are doing this routinely. And, you know, we're, it's because we're high volume centers. We've done this a lot. Um, we know what to look for as far as the guys who need to stay. Uh, and so having that kind of experience, I think really makes a big difference as far as us knowing and guiding patients as to the right um, hospital stay for them. It's actually because you're awesome, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> the next question is, um, uh, is free testosterone used as a preventer or delayer of prostate cancer advancing for you, Dr. Allery? Say the question again. Is free testosterone used as a preventer or delayer of prostate cancer, uh, cancer advancing? advancing? Well, with regard to the first one, you know, we, we've kind of learned in reverse that yes, you know, so men that come in that, that are suffering from symptoms of low testosterone, they, and then if you look at a large enough volume, you can see that, that some men who don't get it, they get the cancer, or actually what they did is they actually looked at for how long they were getting treated for it, and how much uh, treatment they were getting that it would delay the development of prostate cancer and or eliminate it. And then of course, in, in our experience, once they already have the prostate cancer, we check their levels and if they're low, um, we mainly put it on because we know that they're gonna recover physically better. It'll help the recovery of sexual function better. And just in general, it helps them recover better, but it also will secondarily um, not increase the risk and it, and it actually decreases it. We don't have a specific indication to use it to prevent um, the recurrence, uh, but we're not afraid of, of using it to help in the recovery otherwise. So just, I think uh, Mr. Mickelson, who asked that question is actually very prescient because it, the question is if after surgery, it improves things, including recurrence, could it potentially when used judiciously be used uh, as a way to chemo prevent cancer? We don't have data to support that, but it's a very interesting um, idea that you just suggested there that actually probably bears exploring. Next question is, how can we, forgive me, uh, how can we prevent from getting prostate cancer? If I'm uh, TP53, uh, is P53 positive on mutation, does it increase the chance of prostate cancer? Well, there's not a lot I think that you can do other than the, the most important would be just to stay as fit and as thin as you can. And, and you know, the more you reduce metabolic syndrome, uh, you, that's probably the one tangible thing that you can do to try and prevent the metabolic acceleration of it. And that, that's really what it seems to be. If, the, if, it, if it develops, uh, it is a lot worse it, it, and it progresses more rapidly in uh, people with increased body mass index and, and weight issues and diabetes and things of that nature. So staying, um, doing whatever you can do, like a fasting diet for to keep blood sugars as low as you can. Uh, it's a little hard to avoid sweets per se, but I mean, that, that's uh, part of that logic of the metabolic syndrome, but uh, that would be the logical thing. And of course, you know, just a, whatever fit and healthy diet you can, um, you know, stay in tune with for long periods of time, you know, that's going to help as well. You know, uh, more vegetables, more greens, that, that stuff will help as well. And you might get some cardiovascular benefit out of it as well. So <laughs> the side effects of, to a healthy lifestyle certainly go beyond uh, just preventing prostate cancer. Uh, it just optimizes vitality in general. Um, 
And staying but, fit too, being in really good exercise, uh, being very fit is also another factor that will make a big difference. Absolutely. Uh, what is your approach to treating the psychological impact of prostate cancer? Well, so, uh, yeah, please go ahead. That's a, the, you know, I'm, you know, you probably want to hear from both David and I, but you know, it, the best way that I like to describe prostate cancer is like a cancer in slow motion. So most cancers, you know, there's an intense urgency to get rid of it all, because if you don't get rid of it all, or if, if you have an early recurrence, if you don't get rid of that, you know, the survival is not long. Whereas in prostate cancer, you, almost everybody's heard, well, you know, the, even men who've had treatments, the majority of them, if it comes back, they will die with it rather than of it. And, and that statement is true. There's no question that it's true. Even in the highest risk group of men, 50% will die of prostate cancer after 25 years. It takes 25 years to get to 50% of them dying of prostate cancer. So, um, you know, <clears throat> the one of the most important things that we have to deal with is just sort of the fear of recurrence. And then how, how do we treat it? You know, so the secondary treatments. So it's we're not as focused on the fear of dying of the prostate cancer in under the majority of circumstances, but it is uh, how you treat it. So one thing I, that I find with my patients that I kind of yip at them, I say, you know, you guys really need to lose weight and, and stay, stay in shape. And every time I talk to them, they check their PSA and they go, okay, I'm doing okay. I, I, I got to stay in shape. That's what he tells me to do. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cancer in slow motion. And that's the part of it that can be the most difficult. You know, it's the recurrence, the development of a recurrence and then what to do with the recurrence. And, um, yeah, we do a lot of counseling with that. Yeah, and I, I think the mental health portion is is super important. You know, the the common complications as far as urinary leakage and sexual function difficulty that is common after you know virtually all different types of prostate cancer treatment um, affects self-image, self-esteem. And so a lot of men do need counseling. Um, and then we did a really interesting study um, when I was at Penn looking at um, relationship uh, between um, husband and wife or spouse and, you know, going actually through some regular counseling after the diagnosis and treatment uh, we found was actually really helpful uh, for the relationship um, as far as long-term success and um, improved communication. So yeah, so it, it's really important to um, consider um, counseling um, and marriage counseling if there are any issues uh, that start popping up. So forgive me, we have a bunch of great questions, but sadly I'm told that we are out of time and, and we have to wrap this up. So what I can say is we have a men's health center opening. The construction just started. So in three months, there are going to be amazing resources there. So if you have questions, please pop by. You could also get a healthy snack, juices, et cetera, some organic, lovely coffee, um, and join us. Uh, of course, if anyone needs Drs. Lee or Allering as a resource, they are always available um, at UCI Health. Uh, you can find them on the website. They're pretty easy. And I'm going to pass this off to Jennifer now uh, to close us up. Is that all right, Jennifer? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lamon, and thank you to all of today's speakers. And a very special thanks to Dr. Allring. The UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge is proud to recognize Dr. Allring as our 2022 Physician Honoree for his enduring commitment to finding new and better ways to extend and enhance the lives of those in need of care. One of those individuals was Dr. Andrew Edwards, who had been referred to Dr. Allring after his physician discovered cancerous cells. The news of cancer was unnerving, especially for Edwards, who founded and operates the Anaheim Hills Saddle Club, a beautiful full service equestrian facility. However, after undergoing surgery by Dr. Allring, Ed Edwards is now cancer free and is extremely grateful. He shared with us what makes Dr. Allring special is his dedication to the field and the fact that he genuinely cares. He is just exceptional. So today the UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge is honored to celebrate Dr. Allring and Dr. Allring, Dr. Edwards, excuse me, two true trailblazers in their respective fields. Next slide, please. 
So in closing, if you haven't yet, we invite you to join the 2022 UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge, which is an annual peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event where participants sign up to ride, run, walk, or volunteer and raise money for cancer research. We work with corporate partners to underwrite the cost of the event, so 100% of the proceeds go directly to cancer research. We've had 9,300 participants sign up since 2017, raise more than $2.6 million for research. Next slide, please. We're very excited to announce that the sixth annual UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge will take place Saturday, October 8th in UCI's Aldrich Park. It will be a hybrid event with opportunities to participate both in person and virtually. In-person Challenge Day will include a 5K, 10K run walk, 14, 35, 60, and 100 mile bike routes, entertainment, family-friendly festival, and awards. Next slide, please. We hope you'll consider starting, joining, or supporting a team, and all proceeds support promising pilot studies and early phase clinical trials that can help prevent, treat, and cure cancer. Next slide. And please join us for a webinar on breast and gynecologic cancers next month on Thursday, June 23rd from 1 to 2 p.m. Next slide. And if you'd like to sign up to receive webinar reminders or view the webinars and anti-cancer challenge news, scan the QR code on the screen or visit the website listed. So again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.